1. What happened to Els Up? The group was formed through the survival show Queendom Puzzle, with members from already active groups like WJSN, Rocket Punch, Wua and H1 Key, they debuted with Checky last year, and they were supposed to have two comebacks before disbanding. But it's been 11 months since their debut and it's just radio silence, Els Up was originally set to be managed by Wake One, but they ended up getting moved to a different company, word is. Wake One couldn't handle them because they were too busy with ZB1 and Kepler, but now out of nowhere, they've got the capacity to co-manage the new rookie group Isna? Makes no sense, Els Up was also supposed to have a comeback last May and perform at KCON, but both got scrapped for some unknown reason, now the members are just promoting with their original groups. Els Up's situation is a classic case of a group that never should have come together in the first place. The lack of synergy between the members is glaring, individually they're talented, but as a group they're just a mismatch, the two rappers bring the same energy. The main vocalist doesn't match the rapper's vibe, and the other four members have neutral voices that sound bland together, their visuals, dance abilities and stage presence are all over the place, making it hard to fit them all into a special concept, it's like trying to fit puzzle pieces from different sets together. No matter how you arrange them, it doesn't make a complete picture, their debut was underwhelming as well, with album sales hovering around 50,000. It's clear the audience wasn't buying into the concept, literally and figuratively. The company probably thought they could pull a Kepler or Eyes One and ride the project group wave to success, but the reality check hit hard, without strong sales and widespread interest. There's no incentive to push forward with more releases, it's not worth risking the momentum of the members' original groups for a project that's already floundering. And that's the other issue, everyone's too busy, Purple Kiss is on tour. Wu Ah and H1 Key have their own schedules, and Els Up is just left in the dust, with their debut tanking. There's no way the company's going to prioritize a comeback that would only clash with more successful activities. It's like they're just waiting for the contracts to expire so they can quietly move on. Els Up was doomed from the start due to poor planning, mismatched members and weak sales. It's no surprise they're likely fading away just like Classy did. 2. Hive's touring strategy is a head-scratcher. They're stuck in this rinse-and-repeat cycle of hitting the same old spots, Korea, Japan, America and a few token Asian countries, while completely ignoring huge markets like Europe, Latin America, Canada, Australia and Africa. It's like they're deliberately turning a blind eye to these markets. And just to be clear, it's not because there's no demand. Fans in these regions are just as hardcore as anywhere else they would sell out venues without breaking a sweat, other companies are out here cleaning up because they actually understand this, YG didn't hesitate to send Blackpink on a proper world tour, and even rookies are getting their turn, stray kids, twice and even 80s are proving there's money to be made in Australia, Europe and Latin America, so what's Hive's excuse? They've got groups like Luceraphim, New Jeans, TXT and Inhypen who could easily pack venues in these regions but they're just sitting on their hands, and 17? It's criminal that they aren't playing in these markets, 17 is arguably the biggest active boy group at the moment, they could easily draw bigger crowds than any other group that tours globally. The kicker is that the barriers Hive might point to don't seem to hold up, dynamic pricing works in Europe, and Live Nation who they're already in bed with operates there just fine, other companies aren't having issues with regional regulations, so what's the deal? 3. The idea that Cat's Eye is already failing seems premature, they haven't even released their debut album yet, but fans have already slapped the flop sticker on them, expecting them to trend worldwide overnight is delusional. The western pop market isn't some fairy tale where talent equals instant success, Sabrina Carpenter and Chapel Roan didn't just snap their fingers and suddenly everyone knew their name, it took years of grinding before they got any recognition. Cat's Eye deserves the same patience, but the K-pop fandom isn't exactly known for that. In a market where first impressions can make or break you, fans are quick to toss a flop label on any group that doesn't hit big immediately. So Cat's Eye's future is shaky if they don't pick up steam soon, which is only possible if Hybe plays their cards right, but historically, Hybe's track record with promotions is spotty at best, so I'm not holding my breath. The western market is a whole other beast, it's already saturated, and trying to break into that with a global group that doesn't follow the traditional K-pop playbook is a tough sell, the cultural quirks of K-pop. Like same-sex skinship and the whole age hierarchy thing are part of what draws a lot of fans, stripping that away while still trying to market these global groups under the K-pop umbrella just feels awkward and out of touch. The real issue isn't the talent of the members, it's the muddled marketing strategy, HYBE and JYP seem to have this grand idea of a global girl group, but they haven't communicated what that actually means, it's like they're throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks, but nothing's really clicking. And let's not even start on the English songwriting in K-pop. It's like they've forgotten that American pop thrives on wit, relatability and humor, without that, 
These songs are going to fall flat with the audience they're trying to reach. 4. Hyuna's hate is pathetic. I don't like her either, but stalking her social media just to spit venom? That's a whole new low, and it's honestly kind of obsessive. If someone dislikes her that much, why are they putting in the effort to follow her every move? It's like people are thriving off their own negativity, and it's pretty sad to watch. Dragging Gohara's name into this mess is even worse. Gohara went through a lot because of cyberbullying, and now her memory is being twisted to fuel more of the same garbage? It's hypocritical and disgraceful. People who claim to care about Gohara are doing exactly what she suffered from, and it's clear they've missed the point entirely. Bullying is not how we can hold Hyuna accountable. When it crosses into misinformation and harassment, that's where the line needs to be drawn. What's even more ridiculous is how her boyfriend is skating by untouched. It's classic double standards. Hyuna gets dragged through the mud while the man involved is practically invisible. If people want to be outraged, at least spread it around fairly. This whole situation reeks of misplaced anger and sheer pettiness. 5. 10 years into their career, Red Velvet finally made their Billboard 200 debut. Their comeback cosmic debuted at number 145 on this week's Billboard 200, which is absolutely crazy. Especially when you realize Red Velvet had zero promotions in the US market. For a big fur company, SM is not even trying with the US, no promo, no radio shows, no US tours, no website or store, no English songs and not even an update on the group's official account, SM literally couldn't care less, the only reason Cosmic made it to the charts was because SM finally decided to toss a few copies into US stores, but it's been more than a month since Cosmic was released, which means most fans had already bought their copies from international stores. The fact that the album still did well is a miracle, it's a testament to the fandom's loyalty, which is something SM clearly doesn't deserve. It's infuriating to see how SM has squandered Red Velvet's potential in the US. They've been in the industry for a decade, and only now is SM getting around to giving them basic distribution? If they had put in even the slightest bit of effort, Red Velvet could have done so much more. 6. Tell My Mama by Card is a disappointing attempt to stay relevant. Card has been known for their ability to bring something different to the table especially with their early adoption of the tropical trend, but with their recent drops, they've taken a nosedive into mediocrity. New comeback Tell My Mama is a half-baked effort to blend into the new-gen K-pop scene, which is already being dragged for sounding too much like Western pop. Tell My Mama embodies everything wrong with this trend. It's bland, generic and lifeless. The production feels like it was pieced together from the scraps of every forgettable pop song that's clogged up the airwaves over the past few years. There's no creativity or ambition here. Just a lazy rehash of tired ideas. What's most frustrating is that Card has the talent to do better. The girls' vocals stand out as a highlight, but they're suffocated by the uninspired production. And the boys' rap sections are weighed down by overused effects that make them sound bored and detached. It's a shame because this group has proven they can shine when given the right material, but Tell My Mama is not it. 7. Stop with the nonsense that Red Velvet is disbanding. People are desperate to push this tired narrative every time Irene blinks or Sulgi breathes ever since Irene's scandal in 2020. Their comebacks are always coupled with disbandment speculations. If you've been paying attention, you'd know the group has been nothing but active since then. They're dropping music as a group, pushing solo projects, and Sulgi literally just confirmed they're working on a new album. How does any of that scream disbandment? It doesn't. It screams that they're still in the game and aren't planning to bow out anytime soon. Why do doomsayers keep bringing this up? It's like they want to manifest it into existence and it's exhausting for everyone who actually enjoys Red Velvet's music. SM doesn't even have a history of disbanding groups, look at FX, they're technically still around. Even if in spirit more than action, Red Velvet's been around for a decade, but in K-pop, some people act like once an idol hits 25, they're ready for the nursing home, Red Velvet is proving that's just stupid, they're still relevant. Still making hits and still here. 8. Stop saying Baby Monster lost their pre-debut hype, I seriously don't get it. Baby Monster has managed to keep their pre-debut hype alive and well, they're doing great right now, with their music videos pulling in tons of views, making them the most streamed 5th gen girl group on YouTube, their tracks are charting impressively too, sheesh even cracked the top 10 on Melon, in terms of streams, Magnetic by Illit leads the pack, but Batter Up and Sheesh are right behind, holding strong. Among 5th gen girl groups, they've also sold out a Japanese fan meet and had several other successful ones, their debut album crushed it moving over 400,000 copies and setting a new record for debut album sales on Hantio for a girl group. I didn't like their music, but I can't deny that they've kept the momentum going. 9. Let's review Huey's new single Easy Dance, featuring Kwan Eun B. Huey's reputation as a top-tier songwriter and producer is well-deserved, but his solo material haven't quite hit the same high notes, 
and Easy Dance is a clear example of that. The track has a laid-back groove and a touch of funk, but that's about it, it's pleasant, not remarkable. The problem with Easy Dance is that it falls into the same trap as his previous solo debut hum bop, the track is repetitive to the point of being forgettable, there's no killer hook, no earworm melody that sticks with you after the song ends, instead, it just kind of exists, even the collaboration with Unbi doesn't save it from mediocrity. I love Unbi, but she added absolutely nothing to this track.